Um, so just a quick introduction. So Michael is at Bloomberg, and uh, which means lots of things. And Michael always has complained to me in the past that he felt that students are not prepared. Maybe we could talk about that in terms of some of the technology point of view. Uh, but Michael also is on the Industry Advisory Council, so he could help us you know, give direction to the program. But also you, you put us in touch with um, Ivanov at some point from the quant side maybe you could maybe you could start since you're at bloomberg i mean you're not a you're not a, a an mfa graduate but but you know obviously we do a lot of business and we hire a lot of people at um at bloomberg and you could maybe tell us a little bit about how where where do you think the mfe program could fit within the bloomberg environment beyond the usual thing that we see in terms of you know bloomberg is hiring those, um, you know, those things that we have on campus all the time. I don't think we have an, a quant hiring team coming in right to uh, campus to hire right. quants. So, and and I think we, we you got us in touch with Evanoff, but I don't think it really, we connected with him very well. I know Matthew was, to, was on that meeting, but he didn't get back. I don't know, maybe you could give us a, frame us a little bit. Sure. And yeah. And uh, make this as interactive as you want. So if you have any questions, let me know. And I, I threw together a couple pages that I'll, I'll send out afterwards. So uh, some background on me. Uh, went to Lehigh undergraduate uh, probably before you were born. Um, I, I uh, majored in, I triple majored in computer science, psychology, and English. Uh, at the time, there was no, uh, there was a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and things like that, but there were actually no courses on it at the time. So I figured, hey, I'll, I'll learn about the brain and if I can figure out how the brain works and I can program and uh, get, I never did anything with that, but um, so I do have the, that degree in psychology there. Um, I got my master's in uh, information systems with focus on data, databases uh, from Drexel. After that, uh, I've had three startups um, in, in a variety of industries, went to Bloomberg about uh, almost well, 18 and a half years ago. Uh, so I've been there, uh, started out as lead data architect, designing all the database solutions for uh, where we collect all the data that we then distribute to our various platforms. And for the last 12 years, I've been kind of working on a startup inside of Bloomberg of uh, business intelligence, data warehousing, data management. So the team started with just me on one project, but now uh, lead that for the entire organization, about 70 people that are doing it uh, across petabytes of data. Um, so where can you fit in? Um, well, I, I guess I can kind of pop up uh, something sure. through together quick. Um, so Dr. Zara was asking a little bit about quant research. Now I, I am not a quant, um, but these are kind of typical areas that we're working on across the organization. So you can see a, a wide variety. Um, you know, again, from our perspective, we are not uh, we are not doing the investing. We are not uh, making the recommendations. Our job is to uh, provide everybody with the tools to do those. So we are kind of positioning ourselves. Like if we're giving a recommendation, we'll tell you what happens if in the bear case and what happens in the bull case and let you make a decision. Um, or how do we build the tools around uh, the information that we have in order to um, make your job a little bit easier. There's a, and I'll send this um, out afterwards, but here's um, kind of a bunch of white papers and some areas, if it's big enough, if you can see it, but. Um, some areas that we've been uh, looking at from a quant perspective and what the um, what we're doing inside the industry with our own data. So one that I found pretty interesting was the weather's impact on stock market and uh, the use of alternate data. So we um, we have some pretty detailed daily city information on what the weather was like uh, that goes back years and years and years. So we looked at that data and found uh, deviations from the norm. And then we also have another alternative data set, which is the, um, the, the airplanes 
that are owned by different companies. And we actually know where they're going around the world. And they combined the weather data with where all the airplanes were going and uh, looked to see how did that, in the end, impact the stock market. Um, so when the weather was colder, which industries started going up, which ones went down, so that we can put this back into our product and give, uh, give people additional insights when they're, um, when they're doing uh, their, uh, their research. Um, I also thought, you know, this alternative data one on what we're doing within the pandemic was, uh, was kind of interesting. Um, they were just looking at, at, the, at the volatility um, where's the, uh, is there another one in here, but, uh, oh, the, this automated news story. So we actually mine the data that comes across, um, and we automate the creation of news stories. So there's no text to them, but if we see something, we will create headlines and push the headlines out automatically to, to our clients. So they're prepared that something's happening. And, uh, what they did was they looked at um, the news stories combined with um, uh, activity on stocks combined with something else and were able to pretty accurately, better than random, uh, identify when like m a activity was going to happen. So these are all different kinds of ways that we're uh, you know, using various techniques against our data in order to um, offer our clients an advantage. Is that what Avalo Dimov, is that is that part of his group? You, you had connected us with Avalo Dimov, Dimov, um, Dimov? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Right. Uh, he's a quant and data science research at um, Bloomberg. Okay, okay. Yep. So you yeah, put these so, things together, okay. Um, but there, there's a whole, page of different kinds of research that people are doing out there. Um, another, another piece of this is uh, we've created this new um, platform called BQuant. Ah. Uh, and uh, basically this is putting the power using, we've kind of built a cloud-based platform. I'll start back. We've got lots of data right across all different business areas. And the, the way that the data is, the, the metadata that we have on it is different for each kind of asset class for, for different areas. And uh, it's really difficult to ask questions across those, all of those very disparate data sets. So we put a lot of effort into building a kind of universal model on top of the data set so that uh, people can use a SQL-like language uh, to pull data out by themselves instead of, you know, requiring, um, you know, us to do it for them in a way that they can um, do different kinds of advanced analytics on top of it inside uh, the Jupyter platform. So we were, we were heavily involved in uh, contributing into the open source pieces of it. So, um, so I would say that there's a couple ways that, again, kind of circling back on your original question, there's, there's a bunch of people who are working on how do we take advantage of the data that we have to put new models on top of that, discover new things, create new products out of them. And then there's a piece that is helping build a platform to allow everybody else in the industry to do those things as well. Yes, we had a discussion. Uh, in fact, um, uh, um, Jack, Jack Dean brought this up to my attention uh, in terms of Bitcoin, I don't believe we're using that yet on campus, but I'm talking to a few people to see if we could get that because it would be very helpful, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Bitcoin and the, the BQL usage is one of the biggest growth areas that we have right now. Um, really just mm -hmm. to put the power back into your hands to do some, some cool things. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not a quant, but that's, you know, I, I track down this information and, and work with some people. Um, you asked a little bit about the skill sets. Yes. So, so the first four, these are the ones that were called out by uh, kind of one of the heads of our quant team. 
and said this is really the area to focus in. Um, I added the two at the bottom. Uh, you know, I even with BQL, the uh, the SQL was necessary, uh, and and data modeling. So a big, and I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit if I have some more time. But the uh, you know the biggest part of your job, uh, unfortunately, is collecting data, uh, getting it into a format that you can use it and um, modeling it in a way that can answer your questions and understanding how do you do that? How do you query the data? How should I lay out my data so that it can be useful to me uh, from my perspective is one of the biggest areas of, of growth. I believe that uh, everyone is using Python. I mean, uh, uh, scientific Python. Hey, Brian, are you familiar with these things? Scientific Python and PyTorch? Yeah, I mean, TensorFlow and PyTorch, you can kind of group those in one bin for deep learning. Okay. Scientific Python, that's probably referring to the to the regular data science stack, like uh, Pandas, NumPy, Scikit, just getting around very, very basic Python. Okay. And I think, Karen, you're using SQL where you are right now, right? Karen? Yeah, I think he is. Um, okay. Yeah, I am as well. I'm in that um, Java yeah, SQL oh, Jack, class, okay. professor course. Yeah, so I live um, in the SQL world at work just to get by. Um, I, Apache Spark. That's kind of the next the next evolution into into that. Um, I guess I'll save my questions for for one. Okay, okay, okay. I, I have I have a lot of questions. I can try to answer them. Um, well, I'll, I'll go on. I'll just kind of go through the other piece of of it, which is kind of how do how does my world fit into it a little bit. Um, so, if if you this is actually a piece of a presentation that we gave to to our head of engineering, who's now kind of the CEO of the company, and if you kind of look through this, in order for for you guys to do the really cool stuff at the end. There's a lot of building blocks that need to be in place in order for, uh, for you to do that more easily. Um, so at least understanding the steps that it takes to get the data there. So the biggest problem that anybody's gonna have is how do we produce the data that we need in order to, to actually do something with it. Um, and I, I think that's an under underappreciated piece of this, which is it's really hard to produce the data. Lots of people talk about uh, real-time data feeds. Um, in our world, believe it or not, almost nobody actually needs anything real-time, uh, but the lift to add real-time into anything is, is very significant. Um, the data engineering piece, which kind of takes up most of the middle of this area, uh, to make sure that you get the data from where it's produced to where it needs to land, ensure it arrives uh, all the time, every day, uh, in a regular, in a regular pattern at high quality so that the results that you have make sense is, you know, again, anywhere from 25 to 75% of the effort. So that goes back to the modeling, understanding um, that the, you know, the modeling and making sure it's the way it needs to be is, uh, is really important. I heard a statistic at a conference once, which was, uh, and I don't know if it's still true, but it was true at the time. <clears throat> 80% of successful data science projects fail. So kind of think about that a little, how can a successful project fail? And it fails because you found some really interesting insights, but you can't keep the data flowing. You, can't, you don't have this automated, you're not checking for, uh, you're not making the whole process reliable so that whatever you've learned can continue to be used. And that kind of goes all the way back to this, whole piece, which is 75% of the work. So definitely uh, make sure you under, at least understand that piece of it. Um, and this is what my team does for the, for the whole company. So that's why I'm in that. Um, there is a big opportunity in data engineering. It's a very complex world uh, that requires a lot. So it's not as easy as, there, there's definitely a fallacy, right? So the, the fallacy is, uh, just take some data, throw it in Hadoop, and uh, we're going to connect a machine learning tool on top of it, and we'll get insights out of it. 
and uh, or we'll throw Tableau on top of it and we can get insights out of it. And it's just a fallacy because it, it kind of underestimates everything that needs to, to happen in order for you to actually get insights out of your data. Um, and then this is just kind of a, a little bit overview of where we're going from our perspective. So we've got two components of our data lake. So Hadoop is a big growing piece of it. So that's kind of the newer data lake model. You know, we're about a petabyte and a half of data in there. And then we use Greenplum, which is uh, an MPP database. It's basically Postgres, but a massively parallel Postgres. And we actually have uh, two and a half petabytes of data in Greenplum, uh, just because it's it's better performance. Um, but in the end, it's Postgres and it's SQL. Uh, and what we're working on now is this virtualized layer using something like Trino so that you can query your data. Uh, DSP is our data science platform, but you can query your data from anywhere, regardless of where it lands, and uh, have access to petabytes of data so that you can do work on top of it. So that's, that's a little bit about what my team does and how we kind of fit into that big data world. The big thing that big challenge that we have now is thousands of data sets. And uh, how can we um, make sure people can find them, the discoverability of it, and then the, um, the, the documentation and the protection, right? Because all of these are very sensitive data sets. So, uh, so hopefully that kind of gives you a big picture of the, both the data engineering piece of it and what needs to get done and, uh, and how quants can be used in our organization. And go ahead, ask any questions you have. I'm happy to answer anything I, at least I can, or I can try to find them out. Yeah, I just have a questions uh, regarding to the quant department uh, and the rest of Bloomberg. Uh, I know there is like a uh, data science department and also a sales and analytics. How is the the department you're working on uh, work hand in hand with other departments, or are they? Or are they completely separated? So the, um, I would say there's three big parts to our organization. So one is the product side, which has to do with the sales components. Uh, one is more of the um, platform. How do we collect the data? How do we uh, build all the tools that we need? And then our CTO office. So the way it works is our CTO office um, is, is the brainchild of everything. So they kind of figure out all the new technologies we should be doing. They, um, they incubated, for example, the BQuant and BQL platform. And then when they become, whenever the technologies become mature enough, they distribute that kind of into the platform team to support. Uh, that being said, there are a number of data scientists that are both in engineering uh, and on almost every team across the organization. So they'll have their, their own that are kind of specialized into the kinds of work that they do. And yeah, it can go so very wide, like some things you wouldn't think about. For example, our risk organization is using data science to track who comes into our buildings and when do they leave and when do they become a potential threat to our offices. You know, I, most people wouldn't think about that use case um, but it's a real one that we're we're worried about and concerned about. So, thank you. Sure. What else do you want to know? I'll tell you anything. Next. Um, Mike, uh, my name is Brian. I am one of the second year data one of the second year MFEs, um, uh, data scientist out uh, one of uh, one of the many. Fortune companies that are kind of using cloud technologies and streamlining all these ETLs, their Databricks, et cetera. Um, can you talk a little bit if you can? Uh, Brian, you... is it me or lost Brian here? Can you guys hear me? I can, I can, I can hear you. I can hear Brian, okay. okay. Um, can you, if, if you Brian? can dive a little Brian, bit. Brian, we can hear you. Oh, I, I hear you fine now. Um, um, I think it's from your end because we can hear Brian. Wait. So what was the, the question? I was going to say, yeah, um, is it possible? Would you be able to dive a little bit into like the tech stack? Um, 
and a little bit of the cloud-based technologies that you guys are using for your ETLs. Um, and overall, I, interested in a little bit of the data governance side um, and versioning using these new Delta, Delta Lake technologies that are emerging. Uh, so lots of questions in there and don't hesitate to reach out if, uh, if we don't get to them all. Yeah. Um, so we actually have some very, very strict uh, language in our client contracts that say that we're not allowed to put any of our client data in the cloud. Uh, therefore, we've built our own internal cloud. Uh, we've built our own data, you know, Kubernetes-based data science platform uh, that allows us to do that in kind of an in-house cloud. Uh, also, interestingly, the uh, the cloud cost is double or triple what it is to have this in-house, especially at scale. So, uh, for example, we looked at Snowflake compared to our Green Plum instance, and uh, you know our our system is uh, 840 cores or something like that, 872 cores, and at that cost, in, having it in-house is significantly less expensive than using the cloud. Um, so uh, from our perspective, we don't use it too much just because we're restricted in what we're allowed to put out there. But we're using all the same technologies, you know, as much as possible in-house and building our own platforms. To, to follow it up, is that just because of the nature of the data you're providing, the nature of your user, or is that for another reason other than cost? The the client contract piece is, is purely privacy. Um, gotcha. The, the markets, uh, you know, we move markets. So there, now this was, uh, this was probably 17 years ago, but somebody made a mistake on the, the price of a currency. Uh, it was off by a decimal point and uh, crashed the currency of the entire country. And the, you know, we were able to click it, fix it within, you know, a, a minute or something. But the prime minister of the country called and like, why did you like? They wanted to know what happened. Um, you know, again, these these things are 15, 20 years old of, of happening. But mistakes on our side can move markets. Uh, exposing that data in any way is 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 a problem, and that's why it's kind of written into our contracts that we don't do that. Understood. Um, I guess following up, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, when you were listing the when you had the list of technologies up. Um, maybe share the, if it would possible, kind of share the importance of Hadoop, Spark, the whole big data infrastructure, and really in today's age, the importance of kind of scalable, whether it's AI or not, but really scaling from just your tiny little laptop at your desk to enterprise solutions and kind of the importance of that just to the entire group. I think that'd be pretty beneficial. So I, th I think um, Hadoop, again, is on a little bit of a roller coaster. Uh, when it first came out there, you know, my bosses were constantly questioning me, why aren't I moving everything to Hadoop? And uh, now again, going to industry conferences, I'm listening to people saying that the, the companies that didn't move to Hadoop are ahead of the game because they don't have to move off of it. So, um, and, I, and I, we're committed to it. You know, we think it has, has a lot of value. Uh, some are just moving to S3 and building components on top of that. Um, you know, in the end, I find, and what are people doing with Hadoop? Uh, you know, in the end, they're throwing it on high, Hive on top of it so they can run SQL queries on top of it. So in the end, you end up with a worse SQL, you know, a worse database than if it was actually in the database. Um, those are for the more structured use cases. Obviously, for the unstructured use cases, it's, it's better to just have that raw data laying out there, you know, regardless of whether it's S3 or Hadoop. Um, yes, and the scale of the problems are, are growing. Um, we've built out, it, like I said, an entire Kubernetes-based data science platform that the whole company can use. Uh, th there's really an effort right now to separate the, the, the massive storage from massive processing component of this. And um, most people are just asking for compute. My team handles the storage of all the data for just about everybody in the company. So. Um, it's really just become a compute problem, and how do you get you know uh, hundreds of cores of processing power to run through these massive data sets quickly? Again, I know these are super vague, high-level answers. 
um, based on time, but don't hesitate to reach out. I can, if you have more questions, or I can try to connect you with people who are uh, um, kind of dealing more with specific areas within the company. Absolutely, will do. Thank you. Sure. And my team does data governance for the whole company. So I can definitely connect you with uh, my head of data governance on answering any of those questions for you. Interesting. I'm in a battle with that as we speak. So <laughs> that's why I brought it up. Appreciate it. So the big problem that we have right now, the one that we're trying to solve is, I'm not sure if you're aware of things like GDPR, right? which means anybody can, you have to know where um, all of your data is at all, all the time. And if somebody reaches out and says, I want you to re remove my data, you have to be able to do that in a timely fashion, uh, which means that we need to crawl every single data source in our entire company, identify where all the sensitive, sensitive data is, classify it so we know what are, what's the personally identifying information and be able to uh, act on it in a, in a timely manner. So that's what we're working on right now is how do we crawl everything in the entire company? It's a, it's a big task. Hey, Michael, that's a that's really interesting to me. Um, as you continue to kind of talk about this, it seems like a, a large part of the questions that your team is looking to address are primarily computer science questions. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of interested as, as to what your outlook is on, because um, you described at, at the beginning, you know, this is what we're looking for in quants, right? Um, quants and finan financial quants have this, this one um, sort of idea of, you know, oh, modeling, uh, trading strategies, asset prices, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what do you sort of see as the demand for, um, at least from Bloomberg specifically, in terms of that more traditional quant versus a computer scientist and, and sort of where that meets in the middle? Sure. So the way that I like to lay this out is um, if I'm talking about data scientists, there, I kind of generally categorize them as in three different ways. So on one side, you have the domain expert data scientists. They know biology through and through, and oh, by the way, they happen to know all of these advanced analytics techniques they can apply on top of the domain that they really know very well. So that's the one all the way on the left or right. On the far other side is your programmer, right? They can program anything super well, uh, you know, doesn't matter what language they can get in, they can get something done and automate it. And oh, by the way, they happen to know all these advanced analytic techniques that they, they can apply to any kind of problem. In the middle, you have your data scientists. They don't really know a domain very well. They don't really, they're not really good programmers, but they know all, all the techniques they can do. Those are like those PhD level people in the middle. And uh, so I think it's really a matter of when you're going into the industry, kind of figuring out who you are so you know who your competition is, right? So if you understand that domain really well, you know, your advantage is that you know these techniques. If you're kind of on the other side, your advantage again is that you know the techniques, but you're a good programmer. If you're in the middle, you're competing with these PhD, like theoretical data scientists. So if you're not any of those three, if you're just kind of like a citizen data scientist, you, you now you're competing with business analysts, right? Who, right? So you have to kind of position yourself there and build your skills where you're passionate. Again, you know, in the end, for me, it always comes back to where your passion is. So don't do like lots of people say, what do I need to do in order to get a job at Bloomberg? And my answer is, what do you love to do? And that's where you'll you'll do best and get a job in the end, so. Great, thank you, I, I appreciate that. What else do you wanna know? I think that um, Mr. Dobson has a question. Yeah, hi, first year MFB. Um, currently right now, one of my research projects is modeling asset prices as waves. Um, it's probably gonna move off from there and it's mostly gonna be a model for Paris trading. Um, and I was just wondering if there's anyone there that you could put me in touch with and basically talk to about the model. Uh, yeah, just shoot me a note, connect me in LinkedIn. Um, 
Professor I'll, Taro can send my email yeah. out and I'll try to sure find I did. the right I, person. I'll do that. Connect because you me. mentioned the one about the weather and stock. He's not with the weather, he's with the waves in the ocean, but right. you know, <laughs> it's kind of a natural fit here. Yeah, and then especially for the for the weather and stuff too. I, we're also I'm also working on a multi factor project, so it'd probably be useful there as well. Cool. Yeah, we track the same thing. Like I said with planes, we track every ship everywhere in the world and where they're going uh, and what what um, cargo they're carrying and what the impact of you know storms. Maps is, is my favorite Bloomberg function. Them. I got to put that out there. That's my absolute favorite Bloomberg function is maps. <laughs> that's actually really interesting i read an article in the wall street journal that the uh, like a few years ago that they were tracking uh the business jets of fortune 500 companies so basically it was like if they were going you know if the business jet of disney was going to i don't know somewhere where another company or a smaller company was headquartered, then they would say that there's a probability that there's going to be a merger and they would trade off of that. So that's really interesting stuff. Yep. Thank you. Alternate data sets. It's the big <laughs> uh, the hot topic these days. <laughs> Next. Any other questions? Uh, hi, Michael. Second year MFVs here. Just an, a question, a little bit off topic here. So I understand Bloomberg is doing a lot of uh, quit takes on YouTube and a lot of data analytics into the digital yuan currency. So I was wondering how, uh, like politically, how do Bloomberg get around the censorship? Because there's a lot of data that's not really available, not, not really transparent. How, how does Bloomberg get around and, you know, uh, analyze these data and uh, what, what does the process look like? Um, so I don't know that I know the specific answer to how they get around it. Um, you know, our, our media arm is, is pretty large. So we've got, I think over 2000, um, 2000 journalists that are putting out hundreds, uh, I think over 5,000 stories a day. Um, and uh, we're in basically every country of the world. You know, I think we're in like 100, 100 different countries. Um, so I don't know how they get around the censorship piece of it though. Um, it, it, it's definitely a dangerous uh, game. There's like one of our journalists is, is being held right now, is jailed and, you know, there's no uh, been no contact with them for a few years, and they're just trying to figure out uh, what's going on. So that's kind of an active story and concern on our side. So we're not free from the censorship. You know, there, there are people getting arrested. Uh, what what about the data site? Well, so I understand Paul politically. Yeah, you, it's pr pretty hard to uh, get information, but. Uh, does that include like public uh, data collection? So, so the data collection, um, typically we go through, there's a variety of sources, right? So it depends on the country and how regulated they are. So, you know, obviously in, in the US and UK, you know, there's certain required filings uh, and those required filings are, you know, we automate getting them. We have web crawlers that uh, crawl company sites for, posting of different kinds of information so that we can pull that in as soon as it's posted. Um, there are, you know, there are some places where we, uh, we still probably make phone calls and ask people for information. Uh, so it's, you know, we try to be as automated as possible, but I know with, for example, like analyst recommendations and things like that, sometimes we're just reaching out and being on the phone with them and uh, gathering that information manually, unfortunately. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. I don't know if I answered all the everything that you were asking or what their concerns were, um, but again, if there's if there's a more specific question, I can try to find the answer to it. Okay, I appreciate it. Sure. I think one of the interesting things about working at Bloomberg, uh, which most people don't 
see necessarily is that it's not a public company. It's a, you know, it's a private company and, uh, um, you know, you can just walk up to Mike and talk to things about starting you know, new businesses or uh, what was it like to run for president. Um, but, you know, all of our, we're not working for shareholders to enrich them, uh, which is pretty cool. We work to, um, all the profits end up, uh, most of the profits end up going to the Bloomberg Foundation, uh, which luckily in my role, I get to work day to day with the foundation because we're responsible for their analytics as well. Uh, and just kind of see the impact of where, you know, I think they, we were the second biggest giver this year. So it was about $1.7 billion were given away for all different kinds of um, activity. So just being able to actually see and play with that data and see that impact, uh, it's much different than, you know, working to make Warren Buffett rich or something like that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting you said that, um, I guess in that way, because you guys are so huge, really. And still private, you know. There's, there's this thing out there that what is the what is the goal of a company of, of a of a public company? And it's like increase shareholder value, right? Yep. But you, in fact, um, uh, there was a book called the the shareholder the shareholder value uh, myth that you know it doesn't say anywhere that that's the goal of a corporation. Legally, right. it doesn't say anywhere that your goal is to increase shareholder value. And you guys show it, right? You you know everybody's well paid and. And, and, and Michael is a, Bloomberg is a billionaire, so he's not doing it for the money anymore. He's, and the fact that he's still hanging around the office <laughs> means a lot, right? Uh, uh, it must be an interesting place to work, really. And people don't often, or people probably think that the company is public to begin with, uh, which is not. And for him to be able to keep it private for so many years, you know, he really wants it that way. I mean, that's, and, yep. and you guys, right, you, you give a lot of money away. That must be a very nice place to work. Yeah, yeah he just turned 80 uh, on Valentine's Day. Um, so it was, yeah, it's, it's um, there's definitely that culture of giving back of, um, you know, you're, you're encouraged to, to take the time and give back to the community. I did my 50 hours uh, last year and got to donate $5,000 to charities that I really cared about. Um, I'm a big part of our uh, diversity inclusion. So I run our uh, um, our abilities community, which focuses on physical disabilities, mental health, neurodiversity. So I run that for the whole US, which really gives me an opportunity to, to give back as well. So so in the end, I did use my psychology degree in uh, helping everybody mm -hmm. with mental health. So. Great. OK, so the any more questions? Chitali, I know that you wanted to ask a question, but um... No, nothing. Okay. All righty. So, uh, Mike, thank you very much. Anytime. Appreciate the time. Uh, we should have a um, an IAC meeting pretty soon. I want to update you guys into what's going on with the enrollment and the students. And but that's why I wanted you to to hear a little bit what these guys have to say, so you get a first hand view as to their concerns and their. And again, thank you for your time here. Anytime, reach out. Okay. Okay. Connect. Let me know how I can help. So. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.